outside of Nashville, Tennessee. This is the award-winning podcast, Reality. Good evening, everybody, and thanks for tuning in this evening. Of course, I am Sandman, and I'm going to be your guide through this strange realm of ghosts, cryptids, UFOs, aliens, conspiracy theories, and other unsolved mysteries that I like to call parareality. Well, you know, I've been investigating the paranormal since probably about 2004. And during that time, I've had the pleasure of investigating a lot of spooky places. Some of them famous, but most of them are places that probably not a lot of people have heard of. And over the past couple of years, I've really began to focus on investigating cemeteries. And I can't tell you exactly why I like to investigate cemeteries. Maybe it's because they're more challenging to investigate, or maybe it's because I find them both creepy and beautiful at the same time. But whatever the reasons, I love to investigate them. And as I've been poking around them so much for the past couple of years, I started to notice that there certainly seemed to be a lot of symbolism attributed to the headstones. And this piqued my interest, and I began to pay a lot more attention to what was pictured on the tombstones themselves and less to what was written on them. And then I realized that there's an entire secret language among the tombstones. They're speaking to us, the living, telling us a story about who's buried beneath them. We only need to know how to interpret what they're saying to find out what it is that they're telling us. And to learn more, of course, you'll need to turn on, tune in, and find out. However, before we begin tonight's episode, it is time for fan mail. Now, this comes from longtime listener, and I always think I'm mispronouncing this, Venilus. And he always reaches out to me via Twitter. And he says, Heard your recent podcast about the global hum. Thank you for the information about the hum. Yes, even I can hear the hum sometimes. First I thought construction going on somewhere, but now that I'm aware of it, it feels a little strange. Well, thanks for that, Venus. It's always a pleasure to hear from you. You know... The thing about the hum is you either hear it or you don't. There's no, like, sometimes I hear it and sometimes I don't. So if you're not certain, it's like you're, you're hearing it sometimes and then sometimes you don't, you're probably not hearing what's considered to really be the hum. As the hum's always there to people who can hear it. So it could be that there is construction that you're hearing the hum of the equipment if there's some construction going on near you. But I'm not going to completely and totally discount what it is that you're saying. I'm just saying that if you, according per my research, if you hear the hum and it is the hum, you can always hear it. It doesn't necessarily come and go. So you need to pay real close attention to what it is that you are hearing. In other words, If you only hear it every so often, it's probably not considered to be what is the official hum. If you're going to hear it, you're going to probably hear it all of the time. So, Venus, thank you for that, and make sure that you pay attention to when you hear the hum and what's going around you, going on around you, especially whenever you hear it. But normally, it should be, if it's the true hum, you should be hearing that at all times. So that comes from Twitter, from longtime listener, Venomous, thank you very much for that email, Venomous. Ooh, just popped it right off, didn't didn't mean to. uh, I was going to slowly fade that music out. That didn't work out like I had it planned. So, anyway, now that I've answered that email, take a listen to this. Aero Reality is a proud member of the Straight Up Strange podcast network. To learn more about all the awesome podcasts that are members of the Straight Up Strange family, go to straightupstrange.com and get strange.
Hey, how would you like to be an agent of chaos? What is chaos? It's the knowledgeable apprentices of Sandman, and that's what I call my Patreon account members. I'm looking for new agents, and I'd love it if you'd sign up to become one. There are three levels of agents, and all are extremely affordable, $5 a month or less. Each level offers exclusive content, along with the ability to help create podcast episodes and even the chance to be a guest or a co-host. To learn more, head on over to patreon.com slash parareality. 100% of the proceeds from Patreon goes back into producing quality content for this podcast. You are listening to the Parareality Podcast, your information source for conspiracy theories, UFOs, the paranormal, and all things unexplained. New episodes drop the first Friday of every month at 8 o'clock p.m. Central U.S. time. Listen on your favorite podcast station. Turn on, tune in, and find out. If you wish to change, you must first lift the veil of ignorance that has been cast over your eyes. Only then will you see the true power of the universe. All right. Tonight we're going to be talking about the secret meanings behind tombstones. If you walk through any cemetery in the world, you'll find a solemn landscape that honors loved ones that have passed on and accompanying the inscriptions of the names, dates, and family crests and all sorts of stuff of that nature are some common cemetery symbols that crop up repeatedly on tombstones. And this is all around the world, anywhere you go. If you've ever wondered what those mean, well, I'm going to give you a list of some of the most common ones and tell you how you can recognize them, or excuse me, what you what, what they mean whenever you see them. So if you obviously if you have been in a cemetery, which most of us have, not necessarily doing any paranormal investigations, but you know, death comes for everyone. That's the one thing we all have in common, right? Birth, taxes, and death, especially here in the U.S. Um, you've been in a cemetery at some point in your life is what I'm trying to say. Not necessarily investigating, but because you've been there for death, which is a sad occasion. But if you've ever just walked through a cemetery and you've looked at the tombstones, especially the ones that are much older, like from the early 20th century and later, or earlier, excuse me, you'll see that there are some very common symbols that appear over and over and over again on various tombstones in cemeteries all over the world. So here are just a handful of what some of those sim- symbols on these tombstones mean. Now, this is not a complete list because whew, that would take up a long time to to do. So I'm not going to do a complete list, but I am going to give you what I think are probably some of the most common. And then one or two in there may not be as common as some of these others are. So... Let's start out, the first one would be, of course, the eye. So if you feel like someone may be looking at you in the cemetery, you might be near a tombstone that's engraved with an eye. The eye is often surrounded in what is a considered to be a burst of sunlight or sometimes a triangle. And an eye typically represents the all-seeing eye of God, like on the dollar bill or the symbol of the Illuminati or whatever, or like on the symbol for this podcast. So the eye typically represents that all-seeing eye of God, and sometimes people think that it could denote that the descendant, or the decedent, not the descendant, the decedent, the dead person, was a Freemason. The eye of God or the all-seeing eye, symbolizes the all-knowing and ever-present 
God. And during the Renaissance period in Europe, it was common to illustrate the eye of God surrounded by a triangle, which represented the Holy Trinity. And the eye within the triangle, surrounded by a circle and radiating or exposing or expelling, excuse me, rays of light, is used to symbolize the holiness of the true God. So Freemasons often have this symbol on their tombstones, as I said. The second thing you may notice on tombstones are hands. And most common with the hands, they will be clasped, like hands reaching out in like a handshake or holding of hands like through loved ones. Now, seeing two hands clasped together can illustrate um, the shaking of the hands or the holding of the hands, like I said, depending on the position of the thumbs. Now, a handshake can mean a greeting to the eternal life that that person is going on to. If the the hands are clasped together and they have different cuffs, like from shirt sleeves, that could indicate a bond between the deceased and a spouse or some other relative. And if one hand is higher than the other, that could also mean that a person is being welcomed by a loved one into heaven or by some higher power being welcoming that person into heaven. The hand engraving grew into wide use during the Victorian era. So that's when it really started to become a, sim- a major symbol on tombstones that kind of persist into this very day. The third thing you might see would be a dove. And a dove usually symbolizes peace and the Holy Spirit. But its specific meaning depends on how the bird is posed. For example, if the dove is flying upward... The soul is ascending up into heaven. If the dove is flying downward, that represents the Holy Spirit arriving at the baptism of Jesus Christ. And if the dove is holding an olive branch in its beak, that's referring to an ancient Greek belief that olive branches could ward off evil spirits. And on some tombstones, I've personally never seen this, but I found this out during some of my research. On some tombstones, there is a flurry of uh, seven doves. (coughs) And this represents the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit. That would be wisdom, understanding, counsel, fortitude, knowledge, wonder, and piety. So those are the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit. Now, I found this very interesting. Like I said, I've never personally seen a flurry of seven doves on a tombstone. But I do know that that obviously exists because I found it during my research. Uh, I've seen the others with the dove flying upward or the dove flying down. Most commonly, I've seen uh, olive branches in the in the dove's mouth, uh, but I've never seen a flurry of seven doves. So if you are listening to this podcast and you happen to go out into a cemetery or if you have already been to a cemetery and you know that where there is a tombstone that has a flurry of seven doves on it, I would love to see a picture of that. So please... If you happen to find one, take a picture and send it to me. Just email it to me, sandman at parareality.com. That's sandman at parareality.com. I'd love to take a look at that. So we've got the first three, the all-seeing eye, the hands, the clasped hands, and a dove. The fourth thing that is pretty common is a broken chain. Now, medieval wisdom once held that a golden chain kept the soul in the body. And that's what the chain on the tombstone is supposed to represent is a golden chain. So this chain keeps the soul in the body, and it's made of gold. And in death, the chain is broken, 
and the soul is freed. However, if the chain is unbroken, the one that's on the tombstone, and if it features the letter FLT, which stands for friendship, love, and truth, that probably means that the deceased belonged to the Independent Order of Odd Fellows, and that was a fraternal organization. And it its mission is to seek uh, or to promote uh, charitable causes and offer aid and stuff like that. Um, so the chain on the tombstone represents the golden chain of uh, the soul. And that's what keeps the soul in the body. So the chain is supposed to be broken upon death so the soul is freed, which I find very interesting. Um, I've never seen the odd fellow one, the FLT. Once again, if you are out there and listen to this podcast and you happen to know where one of those is at or if you run across it in some of your investigations with cemeteries, please, once again, take a picture of that. Send it to me, sandman at parareality.com. I would love to, uh, to get a picture of that. So we move on to another chain, which is a broken chain. Now, I already said um, that uh, that's still not a broken chain. Uh, move on to uh, a book, not a broken chain, a book. Um, so a book could mean that the deceased was an avid reader. Maybe, but not necessarily. An open book on a tombstone might even refer to a sacred text like the Bible or the book of life or the person's willingness to learn. So just because you see a book, don't necessarily automatically assume that, oh, yeah, that person was, he read a lot. Could It could mean that. That's one of the meanings. But oftentimes it will mean it will refer to like some sort of, of sacred text or something of that nature. And if you see a dog-eared corner on the right side, that possibly could indicate the person's life ended prematurely before their book was finished. So that means that the person obviously had a lot left to accomplish on this earth and their life was snuffed out early. The next most common is, or should I, maybe I should say R, but it, it is a finger. So here's the interesting thing with fingers. They can be raised skyward or they can be pointing down. So a hand with the index finger raised up, pointing skyward, is one of the more ambiguous symbols found on tombstones. It might because it's pointing up, it might be pointing to heaven or it can indicate the fact that the dead person has risen from the land of the living and gone upward into heaven. Now, this is seen as an important symbol of life. Hands are, right? Hands and fingers are carved into gravestones, represents the deceased relationship with other human beings and God. That's one interpretation of this. So cemetery hands tend to be found most commonly on Victorian tombstones from the 1800s to the mid-1900s, and they're typically portrayed in one of four ways, like clasping, blessing, pointing, or praying. And like I said, a hand with with the index finger pointing up, that could symbolize that the person has risen to heaven. Um... It could symbolize the hope of going to heaven. While a hand with the index finger pointing down is supposed to represent God reaching down for the soul of the deceased. And the finger pointing down doesn't indicate damnation. It doesn't mean they're going to hell. But instead, it most commonly represents an untimely, sudden, or unexpected death. And Every so often there'll be a finger, a hand with a finger pointing at a book, and that book typically represents the Bible, meaning that person was very, very religious. So that takes us through six. 
So the seventh thing is something that might not necessarily be so common that you see, but something that really did pique my interest, which is corn. So if you see a corn stalk on a tombstone, that means the deceased could have been a farmer. It used to be a, a custom to send corn instead of floral arrangements to a farmer's family when, when the farmer died. And it could also represent other kinds of, of, of grain. Alternately, corn seeds can symbolize rebirth. So if you see corn on a tombstone, it probably has something to do with that person was a farmer. The next most common thing that you'll see is a scroll, and I see a lot of these. A scroll engraved on a tombstone with both ends rolled up can indicate that part of life has already unfolded while the future is hidden. Sometimes the scroll will be ripped. Maybe that symbolizes how death can rip apart life. I don't know. Uh, a lot of times a tombstone can look like a, a cairn or a pile of man-made rocks placed to mark a location, and, it would, and the scroll is draped over the cairn. And usually a cross tops this, and this is a way of Christianizing a pagan tradition of using a cairn to mark the location of a burial. And it could also just simply be a way for the late 19th century stonecutters to show off their skills because in the late 19th century, the uh, pneumatic or steam-powered tools were just invented and that could take cold, hard marble or granite and make it ripple and flow like parchment or sheeting if you had someone skilled enough with those types of, of devices to do that. So a scroll could mean several different things. Another thing that you'll see a lot on tombstones is a lamp. Now, a lamp on a tombstone could speak to a love of learning, or it could speak about knowledge, or it might even refer to how the spirit is immortal. So there are three different things that it could be representing here. Um, you don't see these um, a lot on anything or, uh, later than like mid-1900s. Um, so there, most of these are stuff that are, that are later. Or should I say earlier? I keep saying later, that are earlier. Um, but a lamp could have three different meanings. It could mean the person had a love of learning or had a lot of knowledge. Maybe they were an accomplished scholar. Or, like I said, it could refer to how the spirit is immortal. And another interesting thing that I, that I ran across was a camel. And this is one of those things that might not necessarily be so common. Once again, I've never seen a camel on a tombstone. So if you are out there and you're listening to this and you run across a tombstone that has a camel on it, I would really like to see a picture of that. Take a, take a pic with your phone. Email it to me, sandman at parareality.com. So a camel. There's this one particular camel that signifies the Imperial Camel Corps that occupied uh, the desert regions during World War I. Now, this is a single humped camel facing to the left. And a camel can also represent a long journey or a skilled guide. In this case, a guide to the afterlife, which is, I thought, very interesting. I don't know how a camel came to represent a skilled guide. I can get a camel representing a long journey, but a skilled guide, I, I don't know. But that's just one of the things that I found. So the last thing I'm going to talk about is an hourglass. Now, I've seen hourglasses um, before. Not all that common, but I have seen hourglasses. And as you may have guessed, the hourglass symbolizes the march of time. An hourglass lying on its side might mean that the deceased died suddenly, while a winged hourglass, that could mean how quickly time flies. And I think that's pretty obvious. And it may also be construed as a message to the still living, which is time is short, so you don't want to waste it.
So those are just a drop in the bucket, just a small handful of some of the symbols that you may run across on tombstones if you happen to be out investigating a cemetery or if you're one of those weird people who just like to go to cemeteries. There are those people who like it. Um, I think cemeteries can be beautiful, but I'm not one of those people that's going to it's going to go to the cemetery. You know, that's not how I'm going to spend my Sunday afternoon. You know, Hey, what are you doing? Oh, let's go to the cemetery. I don't have anything else to do. Let's go to the cemetery and walk around. No, I don't got it. Not going to be that person. <laughs> so I've had people ask me, what is it, you know, about cemeteries that make, that draws you to them, that makes you want to investigate them? And like I said at the top of the podcast, I don't really, I can't really put – uh, just one thing. I can't put my finger on it. I can't say this is the, the reason. Um, but I, th- I think it's it's probably a combination of the fact that you, it's a special type of paranormal investigation because there are so many things that can contaminate your evidence and you really have to be really meticulous about um, your review. And you have to have... I'm not going to say specialized equipment, but you can't necessarily always use the same type of equipment that you're going to use when you're doing uh, a paranormal investigation on on the interior. Now, it's been a long time since I have done anything topic wise as far as paranormal investigations. So I kind of thought this was a a a good time to to bring something up in that in that realm. Um, so let me talk to you a little bit about investigating in a cemetery. First of all, how I got into investigating cemeteries was when I went to Maui, and this has been a long time ago. I can't remember when I went to Maui. I want to say it was, uh, 2006, I think. So it's been a minute since I went to, to Maui, but, um, I was in Maui and, Maui is not that huge of an island, and where I was staying was, uh, I think it's called Lahaina or Old Lahaina. It was in, as we were driving, we took the same route um, almost every day driving, and we would pass by this cemetery that was literally in the middle of where two roads converged. It was like a triangle type deal, and I kept looking at this and I, as we were passing by and I kept thinking, man, those tombstones look hella old. So what I did was um, one, one night I just said, you know, I'm going to go and I'm, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to look around. So I had my little shitty ass digital camera. I didn't go to Hawaii to do any type of paranormal investigations. Right. So I didn't have like any really good equipment. So I went with my little shitty ass uh, digital camera that I had on me and I took some pictures and, you know, the middle of the night at the cemetery, all these cars passing by and stuff. And I got to thinking, I was like, man, I sure would like to be able to investigate this place for real. But it sure would be hard with all these cars passing by. And, and you take pictures and there's dust and bugs and all that other sorts of stuff flying around in it. And I'm like, man, this is this would be hard. And then you fast forward uh, a, a few years in the few, in a few years later and... I was in Gatlinburg, Tennessee, and I went to this to another cemetery that was literally kind of built up the side of a of the mountain there, and it was at night. and uh, I took some pictures and did some investigating and stuff, and and I was like, "Wow, you've really got to know what you're doing to you know to do this." And I kind of started be- being becoming fascinated by doing paranormal investigations outside. So, rock along, and I've done a lot of, well, I'm not going to say a lot. I've done a, my fair share of paranormal investigating outdoors, especially in cemeteries. So, if you're one of these people who like to to go out and do paranormal investigations, I even if you're a beginner, I would suggest going out and doing a cemetery at least once 
So what you're going to need is you're going to need a good supply of batteries. You're going to need a good quality digital recorder. And you're going to need a, a great camera that's got some good megapixels on it. And if you've got a night vision camera, that would be great, or infrared, uh, ultraviolet, whatever you can, whatever sees in the dark, that would also be great. But if you have one of those cameras, the digital camera that is set up, not a video camera, like I was just saying, but a, a digital camera that can take night shots, you really need one of those as well. So I don't suggest trying to go and set up some sort of like DVR video type thing. Um, I think you need to have something where you're going to be mobile. And you have to go, and you can't just go in and start just go up to a tombstone and say, oh, this looks cool, let me start randomly asking some questions, or just stand in the middle of the cemetery and start randomly asking some questions. Um, I have found that it's good to scout these places out during the day. You can do it the, the day of the night of your, in, of your investigation or the day before, whatever, but you should go out during the day for a couple of different reasons. Number one, to get the lay of the land, to see what's there, where, where some dangerous areas are that you might not want to, you know, go at traipsing around at during the middle of the night. But number two, you are looking for two or three or at least one headstone that really speaks to you empathically. And it doesn't have to be some, the one that's old, like 200 years old or from the early 1900s. It could be someone who died 10 years ago. Uh, you need to walk around out there and look it over really well. And if it's a large cemetery, you need to pick one spot, one area where you're going to investigate. But you need to go to uh, uh, an area that speaks to you empathically. And that's where you need to concentrate your investigation at. If there's one or two or three tombstones or headstones that that – speak to you and you're thinking, oh man, I, I, I feel like I need to, to be at this particular tombstone, then take a little flag and mark it or mark it with something else. Um, but mark it somehow or just make a mental note of where it is. But one of the other things you need, of course, is a good flashlight um, to go out there so you can obviously so you can see but when you go back that night and you find your markers where your tombstones are that's where you set up your investigation so you turn on your digital recorder you take your night shot camcorder you take your digital camera and you start doing your investigation now one of the things that you're going to have to really really watch when you start reviewing your evidence is going to be contaminants so there's a lot there's a lot of stuff outside that you're going uh, audio stuff when you're doing your when you're rolling on your digital recorder audio stuff really can be horribly contaminated so you have to you can't 100 percent rely on audio stuff however if you have a picture of something and you can back that up with some sort of audio at the same time you took the video or you took the, the digital picture then you've got some sort of corroborating evidence but you can't use any audio out there as standalone evidence because there's just too much contaminants unless you get some sort of class a evp which is very rare Um, so you need to conduct your investigation just like you normally would with the exception of it's outside so you need to be careful about where it is that you're stepping watch what you're doing just like you would if you were indoors too but you have to be mindful of contaminants. You also, when you're reviewing your video evidence and your digital still pictures, you have to make sure that you can recognize bugs and rule those things out, all kinds of insects, orbs. If you see an orb, I'm not a real huge um, orb guy, not like I used to be. 
Um, but if you see an orb, you're going to have to make sure that it's not some sort of dust or contaminant or other type of, of particle. So you, there's, I mean, I, this is just real tip of the iceberg stuff. I could probably do an entire podcast on how to investigate in a cemetery, which is actually a pretty good idea, and I may do that in the future. But that's, this is just tip of the iceberg stuff, just stuff that you need to, to, to know to get started. And I am a, a firm believer in less is more. So if I'm going to go do any type of investigation, you're not going to see me carry a pickup truck worth of stuff, equipment. I like to be mobile. I like to have just what I can carry. Um, you know, I, I, I may have a small backpack that, that has some stuff in it, but for the most part, um, it's really just me and a night shot video camcorder and um, a digital recorder. And I may have uh, a K2 meter or, or even a, a spirit box or something of that nature, but I'm not going to carry a lot of equipment. And this is true not only if I'm investigating a cemetery, but also when I'm investigating this period. I don't have... I, I really believe that less is more, and I don't like to carry a shit ton of equipment with me whenever I go investigating. So that's just some tip of the iceberg information for you when you go visit a cemetery. Um, I think that the lure of, I mean, you know, of course, that they're, when you're going to, to investigate, you're like, oh, well, I want to investigate this area because somebody died there and there's their ghost or there's a spirit there of someone that's deceased. When you're a cemetery, you're surrounded by the dead. You know that they are the, the dead are there, right? So you don't have to wonder if this legend is true about there being a dead person here or the spirit of a dead person. There's probably plenty, there's dead, plenty of dead people there. There's probably also plenty of spirits in that area as well. But one thing you have to really be mindful of that I really can't stress enough is to be respectful of the dead. So don't go out there and don't bring your Ouija board and start doing Ouija stuff. I don't recommend that anyway, but if you're into that, the cemetery, <clears throat> even though it's a popular place for the kids to go do Ouija, don't do Ouija in a cemetery, please. Don't be disrespectful. You're going to walk over tombstones and you're going to walk over graves and stuff like that and that is fine that happens but don't be disrespectful don't do anything to desecrate the resting area of the dead so don't steal a tombstone don't take a whiz on someone's grave you know don't go out there and leave your your plastic water container on someone sitting on the top of someone's tombstone or anything like that. Just be very, very respectful. Um, I think it's important that it, when you find the location of that, that one area or even the two or three, if there's more than one, you find that location, the one that speaks to you empathically. When you go out there, the first thing you should do when you begin to establish contact is you should say, I am here in a respectful Way. I mean, no disrespect or harm to you. I wish to communicate with you. Ask for their permission to communicate. Thank them, whether you get evidence from them or not. Thank them. Wish them well. And then move on. And before you leave the cemetery, you should turn around and you should thank all of the dead that are there for allowing you to come into their realm and do your investigation. But once again, please be as respectful as as you possibly can, please do not be disrespectful of the dead. And speaking of being disrespectful for the dead, I've got this audio clip here that I wanted to play. It's actually two audio clips combined into one long, and it's about four and a half or five minutes long. Um, as I was doing some research for this podcast, I ran across a story that happened... Uh, a couple of months ago, actually three months ago in March, um, from my home state of Alabama. Now, this didn't 
uh, happened in my hometown, but it happened in my home state of Alabama. And this is, um, well, this is people being disrespectful of the cemetery. So this first uh, first part of the clip is a little, the, the audio is a little low, so I'm going to try to make some adjustments. But, yeah, I, wa- I want you to hear this. This is two clips combined into one. It's two news stories. So you'll hear the first one, then there'll be a little bit of a pause, and you'll hear the second one where it kind of finishes up. It, it, it winds up everything. And this comes from uh, Selma, Alabama, and this is what, what it's just people being rude and disrespectful of a cemetery. Cemetery who done it tonight in Selma. The alleged theft about history, a stone chair, and what investigators believe is a strange ransom demand. Selma police got the case back on March 9th. WSFA 12 News reporter Brian Henry has the update from Dallas County. It wasn't just any old chair stolen from old Live Oak Cemetery, but a heavy stone ornate chair in memory of Jefferson Davis. The historical marker next to the slab tells you all about it. I had to take at least four or five people to move the chair. The story at the moment, though, is who took it and why. The chair was taken around uh, for pilgrimage, maybe you know, someone that might have been visiting from uh, another county or saw it and you know, came back and got it. It's not entirely clear who allegedly stole the chair, but one group calling itself White Lives Matter is claiming responsibility. Local authorities aren't sure for now whether this group is legitimate. People have told me they've heard of this, 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 this group, so apparently it exists. And mixed in with all this is a ransom demand if it's true. White Lives Matter reportedly says it will return the chair in one piece when the National United Daughters of the Confederacy in Richmond, Virginia, will hang a banner on Friday of this week on its building, the very anniversary of the Confederacy's surrender in the Civil War, more than 150 years ago. The banner basically said that uh, the rulers of the country value property over lives. And Michael Jackson and the Chiefs say they believe the chair could be worth as much as a half a million dollars. You know, it is. A, the chair is over 100 years old, so. The cemetery mystery remains a mystery in Selma. No apparent witnesses, no one's talking, no identifiable clue on the relics' whereabouts. In Selma, Brian Henry, WSFA 12 News. The police chief says because of the stone chair's value, those responsible will likely face a felony theft charge. We also want to point out WSFA 12 News did reach out to the National headquarters of the United Daughters of the Confederacy in Richmond. We were unable to reach anyone or leave a message. New developments tonight in the missing Jefferson Davis stone chair from a Selma cemetery. That chair has now been found more than 300 miles away. Here's Brian Henry in Dallas County with the latest. The chair is coming back home. Uh, We started receiving tips of the possible location. The case broke open two days ago. Dallas County Sheriff Mike Grantham's team received the initial call. We even had some cell phone communications after we started collaborating with them a little bit. County investigators immediately alerted Selma police, and before long, New Orleans police became a major part of the investigation. And after looking at video footage, they were able to go back and apprehend two suspects. New Orleans police found the stone chair weighing hundreds of pounds at a tattoo parlor Thursday morning. Two people face one count each of receiving stolen property. Investigators aren't releasing their names for now, but the male is 32 years old, the owner of the tattoo shop, and the second suspect is a 24-year-old female. At this point, I really can't tell you what I make of it. It's not known yet whether the two actually stole the chair from Old Live Oak Cemetery in Selma. Uh, We can develop enough probable cause to, to determine who exactly took the chair out of Selma, they will be arrested. Meantime, high praise by the national chapter of the United Daughters of the Confederacy. The organization publicly thanked New Orleans police for their work in resolving the case. The Confederate group says the chair is now back in Selma and will be returned to its original spot. For now, it is being kept at an undisclosed location. Still unclear is whether the two people are connected to the so-called White Lives Matter group that's claimed responsibility. Part of this ongoing investigation is to determine whether White Lives Matter is even legitimate. I mean, that, that probably being looked at. What is real is the Jefferson Davis chair is back in Selma, not damaged, and is now the seat of another wild story from the graveyard. In Selma, Brian Henry, WSFA 12 News. 
The United Daughters of the Confederacy says that ornate chair is worth a half million dollars. It was placed in Old Live Oak Cemetery in 1893. So that's just an interesting couple of news stories. Uh, actually, one news story out of my home state of Alabama. And it's just an example of people being disrespectful to the cemetery. Now, it wasn't... Um, Jefferson Davis wasn't um, buried there. Um, it was just a chair that was there to, you know, commemorate him and, and, and stuff that he had done for the state. And it was a big, I've seen this chair, and it's a big stone chair. Hundreds of pounds, so there had to be at least five, six people who stole this thing. And literally, they just lifted it up from the platform that it was sitting on and took off with it somehow. Obviously, there was no video surveillance out there. I bet there will be from now on. That's probably why they haven't put it back up yet is because they're waiting to put some video surveillance out there. But still don't know how it wound up in a tattoo parlor in New Orleans, but I, I suspect that the two people that have been arrested for this are probably going to be singing like canaries here before long. So no real reason to steal that chair, and at least not a good one. But if you're going out there, and, and these people obviously went out there with the sole intent and purpose to steal the chair. But if, and, and I don't think that anyone who's going to do a paranormal investigation of a cemetery is going to go out with the intent of taking a souvenir home from the cemetery, especially not, a stone chair that weighs how many hundreds or thousands of pounds on that. So anyway, my point is, please be respectful to the cemetery, be respectful, respectful to the dead, and be respectful to your environment. Don't leave your trash out there. Don't pee on a grave. Don't be rude. Just be respectful, and you'll probably get some pretty good results. Well, everybody, short and sweet episode this evening, so that about does it. Thanks for listening. Before I roll us out of here, I'd love for you to listen to one more thing here. If you like being scared, just the feeling of your throat tightening with fear, maybe be unable to scream excitement. If the answer to these questions is yes, and you should listen to Scared to Death, stories of suspense, science fiction, and horror. Scared to Death airs the third Friday of every month at 8 o'clock p.m. Central Time. Tune in for the fright of your life. <laughs> things are going in the world? Have you always wanted to save whatever was on your mind without having to listen to some bitch about it or suffer any repercussions? Well, me too. That's why I created the Set It Off podcast. I'm sick and tired of the stupidity that's going on around here, and I'm going to let everybody know how I feel about it. So hop on board this train and fasten your seatbelt because I'm about to set it off. Set It Off can be heard on your favorite podcast station. New episodes drop on the fourth Friday of every month at 8 o'clock p.m. Central Time. You never know what I'm going to say next. Hope that you enjoyed tonight's episode of Parareality. If you want to leave a comment about this episode or anything else about the podcast, previous episodes, whatever, let me tell you how you can get in touch with me here because there are a few different ways that you can do it. And here they are. The best and easiest way is to email me. My email address is sandman at parareality.com. That's sandman at parareality.com. Or you can find me on Facebook. That's 
facebook.com slash sandman.parareality. You can post a message on my wall or send me a DM or whatever you want to do there on Facebook. But that's how you can find me there, facebook.com slash sandman.parareality. Or if you have a Twitter or Instagram account, you can follow me on both of those. My username is at Parareal Radio. That's at Parareal Radio on Instagram and Twitter. And finally, you can always call me here in the secret bunker on the studio line. That number is 615 692 11 Seven zero six one five six nine two eleven seventy. Call me here on the secret bunker. Leave me a message on the studio line. But I want you to remember this: if you do decide to call and leave me a message, you're giving me permission to play your comment back on the podcast. So if you don't want that to happen, you'll need to let me know somewhere in your message. Now I'm always looking for interesting stories for the podcast. So if you've got a story that you'd like to get here on the show, tell it to me over the voicemail. There's about a three-minute time limit, so if you run out of time, call back and pick up where you left off. If you're interested in being a guest to tell your story, let me know. I specialize in interviewing the everyday common man, just like myself. You know, yeah, sometimes I get some famous or semi-famous people on here. Maybe they've written a book or something like that, been on a TV show or whatever. But I really like to talk to common, everyday people just like me who've had some sort of experience that they can't explain. And maybe maybe you, you've had some weird something happen to you and you're looking for an explanation. Maybe you're looking for help. Maybe you just want to tell your story. That's fine. I'd love to have you on the podcast. So, Those are all the different ways you can get in touch with me if you want to be a guest or if you just want to let me know, hey, (coughs) excuse me, if you want to let me know, hey, I love your podcast or you suck or this episode that you just did suck, you weren't on your A game or, you know, whatever, hey, let me know. I always love to hear from people, good or bad. So let me recap this. Here are all the ways you can get in touch with me here in case you want to tell me you like the podcast, maybe you want to tell me I suck. Maybe you got a story you want to tell. You want to be uh, get get your story out there. If you're interested in being a guest, hell, I don't care. Here's how you can get in touch with me: email. First and foremost, easiest way to do it: Sandman at parareality.com. Find me on Facebook, facebookcom slash sandman.parareality. Send me a DM or whatever on Twitter or Instagram at Parareal Radio on Twitter and Instagram. That's at Parareal Radio. Or you can always call and leave a message on the voicemail here in the secret bunker. That's 615-692-1170. That number to call once again is 615-692-1170. Remember, I got a three-minute time limit on that voicemail, so if you get cut off, just call back up and pick up where you left off. And if you don't want me to play your comment back on the air, you need to let me know somewhere in the voicemail. And don't forget to visit my website. Parareality.com is a great place where you can keep up on all the latest paranormal news from all around the world. I got an entire page of the website devoted to paranormal news, and that content's updated almost on a daily basis. It's under the Paranews tab right there on the home page. And speaking of Parareality.com, it's more than just paranormal news. You can also shop in the Parareality store. You can watch some of the uh, terrible videos that I've personally made for the podcast over the years, and you can listen to the podcast archives. I've got tons of audio on the website from the various incarnations of Parareality throughout the years, along with my other podcast, my side projects, Set It Off and Scared to Death. And you can find all of that content for free on the archive section of the website. That's www.parareality.com. Make sure you check it out. Of course, you can always hear the latest episode of Parareality on the website as well. Once again, it's www.parareality.com. Now, this podcast can be heard on your favorite 
podcast station, just search for Parareality. And if you've got a smart speaker, you can listen there too. If you have any of the podcast skills activated on your smart device, on your smart speaker, just say, play the Parareality podcast, and bam, there you go. You're listening to me, Sandman, your favorite paranormal podcast host. And by the way, I've got a YouTube account as well. So you can actually listen to the podcast there too because I upload all of my audio right directly to my YouTube account. That's got more than just audio on it. It's also full of some great videos like UFO and paranormal documentaries. I did a, a little news segment that I call News of the Strange that hopefully I'm going to bring back. I had to, as I was getting started with it, COVID hit. I had to kind of stop doing it because of, you know, reasons, COVID and stuff. And it's also got some of those terrible show videos that I, that I did on my very short-lived uh, internet television show. My one-man television show was horrible. Um, whew, man, I, I put that up there for your your entertainment, mainly for so you can laugh at me. <laughs> but, yeah, so I've got all kinds of uh, videos up there. So I've got some chemtrail videos that I've shot myself and, and stuff like that. So if you want to... You can go to that YouTube channel of mine and watch some of these videos. To find it, just go to youtube.com slash user slash parareality1. That's parareality with the number one out behind it. So it's youtube.com slash user slash parareality1. And that is my YouTube channel. All right. The next episode of Parareality is going to air on July the 2nd at 8 o'clock p.m. Central U.S. time. It is... Number two in my summer series, if you missed the first one on The Hum, which was a couple of weeks ago, you really need to go back and listen to it. Uh, My summer series this summer is going to be on Mysterious and Unexplained Noises. Part one was The Hum. Part two is going to air on Friday, July 2nd at 8 o'clock p.m. Central U.S. time. And we're going to be talking about Havana Syndrome So make sure you turn on, tune in, and find out. I hope that this podcast opens up your mind to new ways of thinking, expands your consciousness, and produces a change in the way you see the world. If you wish to change, you must lift the veil of ignorance that has been cast over your eyes. Only then will you see the true power of the universe. I hope you have a wonderful evening. I hope you have a great weekend. And I'll see you again on July 2nd. Good night, everybody. If you wish to change, you must first lift the veil of ignorance that has been cast over your eyes. Only then will you see the true power of the universe.